verse, and it says, Atin Tzavim Hayayim. Um, you are all standing here, and you might see it show up on the bottom. It's a little small. If you're using a phone, you won't be able to read it, but uh, with computer, um, feel free to read along. Atin Tzavim Hayayim. You're all standing here. Kulchem, Lefnei Hashem Alkechem. All in front of God. Rishechem, your leaders. Shiftechem, leaders of your tribes. Eknechem, the elders. Shechechem, your officers. Call Ish Yisrael. Everybody, the entire nation of Israel is standing here, and we're going to learn in next week's parsha, which is the second half of this week's parsha, that um, Moshe, that this was the last day of Moses of Moshe's life. The entire Deuteronomy, entire Devarim was potentially really about thirty-seven days, but t- today, Nitzavim, to to the very end, to Zaysa Bracha that we read on Simchas Taira, that that was the very last day, his last address to his. To his precious nation, it starts now. So, one of the questions asked is, why were the Jews gathered? What were they congregating? What was what was the point? Um, if you remember from the previous week's parsha, um, there were terrible curses that were mentioned. The Teichacha, the second Teichacha that's mentioned in the Torah, that if we do not follow and do not heed the word of the Torah, what will befall us? And the Jews were frightened. They were, their face were ashen. They, they didn't know what to do with themselves. You know, if, if if this is what we joined, that that if Hashem is giving, it's going to happen. At one point, this will take place. They they thought they would be wiped out, and at some point, the entire Jewish nation would be no more. So um, Moshe reassured them that you are standing here today, and just like you're standing here today, your children and your grandchildren will continue to stand. That Am Yisrael will continue on forever. Um, and it's an, exper- uh, an extremely powerful idea. Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar writes, I'm just going to quote him, <speaking in Hebrew> that there are two promises that Moshe promised the children of Israel in this first Pasuk. Uh, we're going to focus on the first one. <speaking in Hebrew> that Israel will continue onwards. <speaking in Hebrew> they will never be destroyed. There will be always a generation, and they will be there forever. Just like you're standing today, Moshe is promising them he will always stand. In fact, if you go on to another, a little further down, so this was verse oh. uh, 9. If you go down a little further down to your Gimel and your Dawid, um, 13 and 14, which is now on bottom of the screen as well, um, Moshe recites the following, um, that not only with, um, yeah, not only with you, as Hashem, um, creating this covenant, creating this bris, that's uh, not just you, those who are with us, um, also, those who are not with us, will also are included in this common. Who's not with us? The generations that will come after you, the multitudes of Jewish children who eventually turn into adults are also standing here. The future generations are also standing here. Therefore, don't fear. It is true that there was a Teichachah last week's parasha. It was true that there was terrible um, tragedy that will befall upon you. But after all the dust, dust clears, the Jewish nation will carry on. And the truth is, I think we all could agree that we are, you know, we are proof to that. Now, once we're talking about, about this idea of standing in front of Hashem, um, it reminds me of a beautiful uh, idea that I heard, especially apropos for, for Rosh Hashanah, for the high holidays that we're going into. Um, that every morning we recite Moida um, Ani. Every morning, and you're going to see on the bottom again the verses. Says, that I thank you, Hashem, the strong and living King, that you so kindly returned me to my life, meaning I, I went to sleep, which is part death, and you woke me up in the morning. And then at the very end, there is a, you know, see that it's in bold, great is your trust. Um, so the, the, the idea, the question is that, what do you mean? What do you mean, great is the trust? What, what, what's Hashem trusting us in that we say this every morning? So in order to sort of bring out the point, let me relate to you the following story that I heard from the great speaker, uh, Charlie Harari. I'm sure you all, you know, you've all heard, heard of him. 
Um, this was on a um, an H video, in fact. H has many videos, and he has this beautiful video that I saw a few years ago. Um, that he says over a personal story that when he was a young boy, um, he was in the high school basketball team. Well, he wasn't the best. He never broke into the lineup. He was what you call a bench warmer, I guess. He basically sat on the bench, helped out during training and during practice. He was on the team. But when it came down to when it actually to play against other teams, he never played. Um, during one day in his second year in high school, he was sitting there on his bench, and now they were down to the last game of the season against the arch rival. This game will decide if they go to the playoffs or not. They win, they continue on to the to, to this playoffs. If they lose, they finish their year. So they were down by two, and it was the end of they were down by two. It was the last two minutes in the fourth um, of the game, which I think in basketball is the fourth quarter. Which I'm not sure too much about basketball. But I see Jules is smiling, so I guess I'm right. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, and their main, their lead player fell off, fell, sprained his knee and had to, and his ankle had to leave. And the coach had to call someone else out to replace him. And the coach's eye is going down the bench, rests on Charlie, says, Charlie, you're in. And this is the plan. Um, um, when you get, when, when, um, um, or whatever you want to call it, when the ball, I guess in football it's called snap. But whatever happens in basketball, when they, when, you know, when, when, when they get the ball, the first one gets the ball, he's going to pass to you. You're going to be open. No one's going to be covering you. And you're going to go for a three-pointer. It's a two-point game. We get a three-pointer, we win. So Charlie nodded his head. He's freaking out. Charlie already said he's freaking out. He, you know, he, he's a bench warmer, and this is going to decide the future of the season. And he goes out there. The ball is tossed to him, and he freezes. He, he just can't take the shot. He doesn't know what to do. And he automatically just throws it to another teammate. That teammate takes the shot. Misses, game over. So Charlie was broken. He knew he lost the game. And they all went back to the locker room. And the, the coach gave them a whole pep talk. It's not about winning. It's about trying. It's about, um, about helping out your teammate. You guys did great. You guys went to the very end. We almost got to the playoffs. The next year is another year. Everyone files out. And, you know, Charlie's sitting there with his head between his shoulders. He's just like, he's between his knees. He's broken. He lost the game. He looks up. The coach comes down, sits down to him, puts his arm around him, and says, uh, Charlie, do you know why I'm disappointed in you? And Charlie said, yeah, coach, I let you down. I didn't take the shot. So, and I didn't believe in myself. So the coach slowly not shakes his head. He's like, no, I, I didn't expect you to believe in yourself. What, after all, you just sat on the bench all year. Well, why I'm disappointed in you is you didn't believe in me. I believed in you, but you should have believed in me that I believed in you. And the fact that you didn't take that shot shows you don't believe in me. You don't believe in my ability to, to lead the team. And that's why I'm disappointed. So we wake up every morning. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem gave us back our life. Um, and as, as you know, uh, Rav Oscar always says, if I'm up in the morning because he wants me to be here, there's something here that I could accomplish. And even if you don't believe in yourself, HaKadosh Baruch Hu believes in you. Otherwise, you would not be waking up. He believes that you could accomplish something today. You could go on with your life, and you could fight to live another day. That is how great is your trust. We're thanking Hashem that how great is that you believe in me, that I could, I could, um, I could actually stand up to the day's challenges. So that was Charlie Rari's, um, his wonderful um, uh, muscle, his one, 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 wonderful parable. Now, when it comes to the idea of standing, I was got me thinking that also, here we go. We've, not only this happens every morning, but it also happens every year. We're at the entrance to New Year. It's a, you know, it's a, it's, the day of, of Rosh Hashanah is a great amount of joy. At the same time, it's a great amount of, of, of fear. Um, and what is, but what is a celebration? On, we're being judged. A celebration is that a Kaddish Baruch who believed in all of us. Number one, he believes in the entire entity of the Jewish people. He believes in each and every one of us. And we are standing on Russia. When we will come to our Hashem, we'll be standing in front of Hashem. And we'll have to believe, if we don't believe in ourselves, that we could accomplish another year and grow in our spirituality and help each other out. At least we could trust, believe in a Kaddish Baruch Hu, that he believes in us. And that's the idea of standing in front of Hashem when it comes to Rosh Hashanah. And that also standing, which was the same type of standing in front of 
sub after some of you are you are all standing here that all the future generations will continue to stand because the Kaddish Baruch Hu believes in each and every one of us. So that's the first pasuk, standing in front of Hashem with that Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Not we will be here. It will be in. Uh, there will be a future for the Jewish people forever. Plus each and one of us. Yeah, Hashem believes in each and one of us, and we'll get back to this at the end of at the end when we get to Vayilach. Um, now we're gonna go on to the next uh, pasuk. Um, this is further down. This is the pasuk of. I'll just bring it up on the bottom. Is Umol Hashem Lehecha Slevavcha Slevav Zaracha. This pasuk, which we'll translate in a second, it's is as we come again. We're coming close to the days of Slichas in Yom Kippur, and it's this pasuk is in. Read it. It's in Lamid and Vav, um, in thirty uh, chapter thirty verse six. And if you go through the slichus, as we go through the slichus starting next week, and then we go through the entire next week, and especially in Yom Kippur, this verse keeps on popping up. And you might might even uh, recognize it. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're asking Hashem, Hashem tells us that He will come down, and He will um, sort of, quote-unquote, cut our heart. Now, what does that mean? And we say this at the end of slichus. As we go through many verses, we always mention this verse. Asking HaKadosh Baruch Hu to come down and cut our heart. What, that's literally what it means in translation. Um, and um, so what is the meaning? So Nachmanis Ramban writes the following idea that the first that this verse is dealing with tshuva, which is the inyan that's what we're dealing with today in, in our in El, to return to the loving embrace of Kaddish Baruch Hu, um, and Orla is, it says, umal Hashem, um, umal Hashem is levav chav So what's umal? Uh, to, to sort of like mila, that's the same idea, a bris mila, the cutting off. Well, what do you do by the by the bris mila? So the nachmanis compares this to the orla, the covering, just like on just just like on the child is an orla, is a covering which just cut off. Also, we're asking Kaddish Baruch to do that to us. So, um, what stops us from doing mitzvahs and following Hashem's commandments? Um, let's face it, we don't fully do it. You know, it's not so simple. Um, you know, if it would be so simple, we just read the Torah, we read the manual, keep the six thirteen, we will never have a problem. But Every day is a challenge to follow it. So, of course, we have conflicting emotions that tell us to act otherwise. Um, and we're humans. We're not angels. And we're in this world to overcome our distractions, overcome the different drives, and not deviate from the right path. So we're asking a Kaddish Baruch Hu to sort of, we want to do good. Naturally, we want to do good. But there's a covering there. Whatever the reason is, which we'll get to. There is a covering there, not letting us go about and act in a and act like an angel, basically. And we're asking Hakadosh Baruch Hu to please. And we're asking, if you look at the end of the verse, it says, uh, "With all your heart, and in order that you may live, you have to. With, if you ask with your entire heart, Hakadosh Baruch Hu will listen to you and assist you to actually follow the path, remove that blockage that doesn't let us continue our life in His service." And that is the pasuk over here. And understandably, that's what we. That's why it's mentioned throughout the high holiday season. Because that's what it's all about. Is asking Kaddish Baruch Hu to help us follow the right path. Now, um, the Hamanis does add on a little bit into this one. Just that's our holidays, but he also understands that this idea of not having pretty much, if you cut off the enti that entire covering of the heart, you, ne you will now be an angel, because you will no longer have any evil inclination. You will have no there's no other desire but to serve Hashem. So you'll be a walking angel, which is. Not far from what Adam was. That was Adam was. Adam was a walking angel. He had one outside temptation when it came to the tree to test him. But overall, he had no inner desire, anything other but to follow God's word. Um, and that is, and that's Bechira. We have Bechira. Adam did not really have Bechira besides for that one thing. And angels do not, um, do not have any Bechira at all. Now, just once we're on this idea of angels and Bechira, um, do angels have Bechira in any way? Do angels have any free will? So, apparently not. We just said that they have no, they cannot act in any other any other way other than Hashem wants from them. Now, however, um, there, there are Midrashim that talk about um, angels doing things wrong. Um, for example, they were the... Um, it talks about the Nephilim. There were these angels that were shot down from heaven because he did something wrong at the time of the Mabal. Um, 
there it when if you remember the story which we're, we're going to get back to it soon the story of Abraham and the three angels that came to him one of them got punished because he said something wrong in a wrong manner so angels could get punished the question is how could they get punished like how could they do anything wrong so Rav Schwab explains based on a verse earlier in the Varim that and we'll get a practical point out of this is that they don't have Bechira in how to act. They don't have free will in how to act. They have to, they are forced because there is no other way in their eyes to act other than what Hashem wants for them. However, how they act, how they go about and fulfill Hashem's will. Meaning, I could be doing something right, but I could be doing it in the wrong way. I could be doing something right and giving, let's say, charity, but I could be doing it in a very haughty manner. I could be giving it, feeling the reason why I'm giving it is because I want to feel rich, or I'm doing it because my next door neighbor gave X amount, I want to give more X amount, or I'm giving an X amount in order because I want to be in the newspaper, whatever the reason is, there are, there are, I'm doing a nice thing, I'm doing the right thing, in fact, but I'm not doing it in the right way, with the right attitude. The same thing with an angel, interestingly. They could go around, and they could do it in a, um, in a, in the, with the wrong attitude. That's the, that's how our shop writes, and that's, um, the, 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 free will of an angel. I wish I had that type of free will, but, you know, if it came down to that, but that's the free will of an angel. So, the way we could uh, go ahead and apply this into our, um, in, into our own life. So, we have a human life, and we go about, and we have much harder tests than an angel, and we have free will, and we could do really bad things, and we could really, we could really do good things. But, every single day is a challenge, because that's, after all, what we are. We are human Hashem gave us challenges in order to grow. Now, some are big challenges you may pick up on. Some are small challenges you may not that you may pick up on, or some you don't even notice. I am sure if you sit down at night and you go through your day, you'll find every single action you did there was one to, there was to do the right and to do, do the wrong, and you chose the right. Well, or whether at this point it's just a habit. Well, of course I go put on the phone. It's just a habit. Other people don't know, not necessarily put on the phone. Whatever the the level is, but it still is. There's two paths in front of you, and um. Even to the point where you always do the right thing, you trained yourself to do the right thing, still then there's, and then you could say, I no longer have free will in this aspect. Well, you do in your attitude. How do you do it? Why do you do it? How you go about to do it? When you give, if you give, again, to pick on charity, do you smile when you give charity or do you do it with a frown? You're still doing the same action, but it's the attitude. And that's what you can learn from angels. The, uh, not only is it what I'm doing it, it's how I'm doing it. And again, to go back to the idea of, of, of Nisayin, it's you should really sort of welcome challenges. But, as we say every day, three times a day, it says, Loy Eldi Nisayin Ro'im. We ask Kaddish Baruch Hu not to do bad challenges. I want an Nisayin. I want a test, but not a bad test. I want a good test. Maybe, you know, give me a million dollars and I'll decide what I do with it. You know, for example. Now, that might be, a, for some people, that might be a bad test. They really might mess up on that. But whatever it is, we don't want bitter tests. We want tests, but nothing that will turn ourselves um, turn our life bitter so again the challenge the challenges are there to help us grow now um, it helps us perfect our lives and perfect our souls but that's the point of a challenge um, now we are going on to Vayelach so let us turn to Vayelach And we are the first pasuk just says Ve'elach Moshe v'Daber said Vama Elo Kol Yisrael. Moshe went and spoke these words to all of Israel. Fine. Now we're up on to the next pasuk. And if you remember, we spoke about today was the day that Moshe died. We mentioned that. And in the next verse, um, that's what you have on the bottom over here. Ve'yemer Aleim. And so we're on 31.2. Um, it's on the bottom over there on the screen as well. If you don't see it, then like if you're on the phone, again, it might be too small. Um, ben Meya Vesrim Shana Anoichi Hayoim. Today I am 120. I can no longer um, go and come. Akash Baruch, who is not letting me continue my life. Hashem Amar Eli Loit Sa'avar Es Hayardain Hazen. And a Kadesh Baruch Hu told me, um, You cannot go ahead and you will not be allowed to cross this Jordan. 
So he has to pass it on to Moshe Rabbein. He has to, sorry, he has to pass it on to Yeshua. And also, by the way, that's when we said back then, when we said they were standing, it's a different explanation that says that today they're all standing there to see the, um, the mouth, to see the kingship pass from Moshe to his student, Yeshua Joshua. That was another reason for the standing. And to go a little, uh, go backwards a little bit, that, the reason is because um, we, we, we Moshe want, Hashem wanted everyone to see that Yeshua is a chosen one. He will lead you. He has been picked, handpicked by Kaddish Baruch, handpicked by Hashem, by God Himself, and then all the Jewish people saw them, saw it pass on to Joshua. So today is his last day. Now Rashi, there's a Rashi here. Um, yeah, the first Rashi on this first Anochi Hayyim. Today I am 120. Amos. What's Anochi Hayyim today? Um, and just say, I am 120. Why do you have to say, today I'm 120? So that's the question. And, and Rashi, based on Mars, derived from here that the extra today is, is complete. Today I die, and today I also um, was born. So it's a complete life. So this is a just a general understanding that if one dies on the day of his birth, usually it's a sign of righteousness. Um, so what's the connection? So it's sort of simple that um, just like he led a complete life, a complete righteous life, he is a tzaddik. He's um, he did everything that up to his utmost that he was asked of him. So just like his spiritually, his whole physically is also whole. The day he's born is the day he's died. A complete, full 120 years without any additional days to sort of like fracture it up. Um, recently, if I remember, I I believe could be I'm wrong. That I think. Um, where Moshe Feinstein also died, died on the day he was born. There are a few recent uh, Torah leaders that the same happened, that they died on the day that they were born. Now, um, I'm going to go to uh, another verse. This verse I don't think I have on at the bottom. Um, let me go find it. Yeah, so this is verse uh, 31, Yud Zayin, Lamed Aleph, uh, sorry, okay, I guess 3117, Lamed Aleph, uh, Yud Zayin. It says, so, V'chara api bo'ivayemahu, and Hashem is saying that, on that day I'll become very upset with you, V'zaftim, V'sartim, Panay Mehim, I'll hide from you, meaning when the Jews, unfortunately, do things wrong, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will um, turn, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will turn of course, is uh, a face from us, and um, uh, sorry, skip. Um, and you're gonna say, so you're gonna say there's many bad happenings to us, and then it's seemingly you did shuva, you woke up, and you said the reason why these bad things are happening is because. Um, I found that I did bad. I personally was acting in the wrong manner, and then you go ahead and correct yourself. Now, that, if that's true, that the last the last part of the verse is referring to tshuva, to repentance, then let's go on to the next verse. Let's go on to verse 18. Um, yurches. But at that point, it, goes, it looks like it's getting worse. I will surely hide my face from you. After all the bad that you did because you're going after um, uh, you'll be going after false gods so the question begs if they're acknowledging their, their, what, their, what, what they failed in then what's the point of the next what why is it that um, why is it why is it that there's a continuation here why is it that if it looks like the tragedy continues and, and God takes it even further so there's two, this is a uh, there's two two answers that I have in mind. One answer is based on Achmanides, and Achmanides does write that the what's going on here is that you didn't do a full tshuva, you didn't do a full repentance. You're just saying, if you notice, what did he say? The whoever whoever's going on is because there's no God in front inside of me, because I threw away God. But it, but 
we don't see anywhere that he actually did repent. He just acknowledges it, but he doesn't act on it. So th if that happens, then the bad is just going to continue because you didn't act on it. It's true, you acknowledged it, but you did nothing about it. So therefore it says, And then I'll hide your face. But, Nachmanides also points out, that it's not as bad as it was before. Because it, it doesn't say it's saris. It doesn't say that there's going to be, um, you're not, you're not going to have, it's going to be bad, but you're not going to have many, many, it's not going to be painful in a way. So it's been that it's been put down a bit because you acknowledge it, but it continues because you did not act on it, which is very important. As we, again, coming, they can't ignore it. We're coming to we're coming to our shining kipper that if you see something which you lack in, number one is you have to acknowledge it. That is a, definitely the first step, but you sort of have to go on to the next step, actually rectify it. That's one explanation. There is another explanation, which is said in the name of the Hasidic masters, that... Um, it's it's you know it, you'll see why it's in the Chassidic masters that at you know at the end of verse 17 he writes halikein elikai bikirbi mitzuni harois ha'ela that you're saying is it's because God is not in front inside of me and they say that the the Rebbe say that there's no such thing as no God in any Jew Hashem is always there and if you refuse to acknowledge Hashem is with you even when it's rough. Even when there's pain, even when there's Royce, Rabbi Saris, when there's terrible pain going on, but you refuse to acknowledge that Hashem is there, then it's going to get worse. And ask to ask upon I who I will surely hide my face in in that in in, the, in your approach to think that Hashem has actually befallen you. Because Akash Baruch Hu will never let the Jewish people go. And again, this takes us back to the beginning, what we we're talking about in, in the beginning. That in Savim Hayam, you're standing here, you are here, you will always be here, and I'll always be with you. And that is the powerful lesson that the Rebbe's take from this verse. Now, we're going to go on to the next verse is 31, 21, uh, 31, 31, I think, 31, it can't be 31, 31, 21, sorry. That's the next verse we're going to uh, go, go to, and I'm going to bring it on the bottom. I missed over there, I made a mistake. I wrote 31, it's really, thir it's really 21. Okay, so the, the verse goes that uh, Again, this is the last day of Misha. He keeps going back to the bad times will befall upon you. And one of the things that Moshe learned, they say that why is that Moshe kept uh, telling off to Kal Yisrael at the end of his days? He was warning them what will come to them. And he never, because he never really did do that. He for 40 years, he led them in the Midbar. For 40 years, he really did not scream at them. He didn't tell them off. He didn't warn them. But as he came to the end of his life, he had no choice. And he learned this from Reuben. He learned this from Jacob. Jacob told off Reuben at the end of his life because he was afraid that if Jacob told off Reuben for the bad that he did in earlier, before he would die, he would walk away from him. Which is that Reuben would walk away from Jacob. We're talking about the one of the Shvatim walking away from one of the forefathers, so it's, it's a tremendous insight into uh, human psychology that Jacob had. He was afraid that his son, and his, his, his son who was one of the shift they call, one of the lead, our lead, one of our great-great-grandparents, would leave Jacob. Just think about that for a minute. How, how could you leave Jacob? He was a shining light. You looked at him, and you would see like as if God's walking on this earth. So how could Jacob, how could Reuven actually leave Jacob? And that's the idea, that he had this powerful insight, what telling off someone can do, and that we all can learn from. But Moshe was telling off Kali Yisrael, he had no choice, it was at the end of his life. And the verse goes that when, it, the, when the going gets rough, there is a fun of the eight key, called Tishkach, or Pizare, Kidati, Sitzre. Kalish Baruch is promising them that even when it gets terrible and it gets bad, still, Shashir is the fun of the eight key, like Tishkach, or Pizare, that this song, and it's in bold on the bottom, that this song will never will always be witnessed since it will never be lost in the mouth of their offsprings. That the song, the Torah, will never ever be forgotten um, from our mouth. That um, now, again, we learned just in the beginning that no matter what happens to Klal Yisrael, no matter what happens to the children of Israel, after the dust settles, the collective nation will still be standing. There's nothing, um, nothing going to argue with that. Um, but not only will the Jewish nation be on, 
but its spirit and soul, which is tied into the Torah, that is our life, our lifeblood, will be with us as well. And the very fact that we're sitting here 3,332 years after the giving of the Torah, talking about the Torah, um, is, is, the very few, is the very proof. And as the saying goes, um, it says, more than the Jews kept the Shabbat, the Shabbat kept the Jews. And we can say the same thing about the Torah, same thing about the Gemara, same thing about um, Tanakh, same thing about the Bible that we're actually studying. And, you know, and the proof is there. I mean, the Jews that unfortunately threw off the Torah, that no longer followed the Torah, um, eventually, they eventually end up leaving Judaism. Some come back, some do stay on, you know, on, on the fringe. But overall, proof has it that if you leave the Torah, eventually at some point, a few generations down, you'll no longer be connected with the, with the, Jews, uh, the Jews of Israel. So, Am Yisrael Chai, we will live on no matter what. We have an eternal existence. And as the, pretty much that was entire, as we went to the parasha, we kept hitting upon this point that the, um, that the collective nation has an, has an eternal existence, as is each and every one of us. And as we approach the new year, let us internalize this point and utilize it to empower ourselves to continue on self-improvement as we learn throughout the parasha.